Hello, I am Darren Korb from Supergiant Games, and I'm joined by Greg Kasavin, and I am the audio director, and I do all of the music and sound design and voiceover direction. Hey, and I'm Greg. As Darren mentioned, I'm creative director. Uh, I do writing and contribute other aspects of game design. We all wear a bunch of different hats at Supergiant since we're a pretty small team. And Darren and I have been working together ever since the Bastion days or more than 10 years now through four different games, um, most recently being Hades. And before that, Pyre, before that, Transistor, uh, all the way back to Bastion. We're here to focus on Hades uh, in particular and what we did with all the dialogue and voiceover, how we got to how we got to all that if you've played the game. Um, a little bit about Hades. Hopefully this is uh, some fun trivia, even if you are familiar with the game. Uh, the big thing about it for us was that it was our first ever early access game. We designed it for the from the ground up, knowing that uh, we would be getting tons of feedback from our community through much of development. Uh, we also uh, made it a roguelike dungeon crawler, a genre we've never worked in before. Uh, we were very interested in infusing this style of play, which involves dying and restarting over and over, with a continuous narrative. So every time you died, the story would advance. That was kind of the thing that we were excited about early on. Um, our team size uh, remained pretty small. We uh, developed the game over a little over three years, and it has been, uh, uh, it has done really, really well for us. We're so grateful for the incredible response, um, including six nominations in the Game Developers Choice Awards. Um, so yeah, we're, we're still over the moon uh, about all that. And uh, the other key feature of the game is that it's our first ever fully voiced game with a big cast. So that was a really big undertaking and we wanna talk about uh, how we got there, but first, uh, here is a taste of what fully voiced meant in Hades. Few tales are told of Hades, whose very name inspires fear and penitence, reminding us of the inevitable fate which we all share. I, however, mean to tell you such a tale. Listen carefully. I understand, young Zagreus, that you would seek to leave that bitter darkness for this bitter cold. Quite honestly, I fail to see why. But I'll aid your plight, why not? For I can offer plenty of assistance. And you soon shall grow fond of it, I think. Your father sent me. All in all, I'd rather be on your bad side than his. Now you can turn back, like a good little man, or I can send you home the painful way. What'll it be? I gather Lady Demet has already got a frigid hold on you. Certainly not the warmest member of the clan, now is she? But do be patient with her, she's been through a lot. Uh, um, I just wanted to apologize because I think maybe I didn't act very appropriately last time you spoke to me. But I just really, really like this job and I promise I will always do my very best, so I just hope I'll have another chance. Pal, thanks again for that nectar bottle from before. Stuff just goes right through me like you won't believe. Though I hope you're not going around giving that stuff away to every bozo you know. You know, Princet, I'd not expected to run into you again, not after all this time. Something I missed down in the house, or what? Not had much company of late, is all. I warned you, short one. Now you face a foe more terrible even than I. The only other foe whom I have ever faced who bested me. Hold, fiend! You'll walk not one more step toward the light of day, so long as I am here. So this is just a sample of uh, all of the VO that we have in the game. This is a little bit of a data visualization. Uh, this is a sample of some of our 30 fully voiced characters that we have in the game. We have over 21,000 voice lines in the game, which we did not imagine we would have when we set out. Uh, even Charon that you heard at the end there, the guy who just goes, has 120 of those. So <laughs> there's quite a few. Yeah, we did not know. Um we did not realize the scope of the voiceover content in this game until we were basically done and having to do triple takes at this, I still don't really believe it, this 300,000 word uh, number. But um, our localization team <laughs> reinforces that that is indeed the case. Um, so how did we get there? We will walk you through that process for the remainder of this talk, starting with the kind of macro view, uh, the initial questions that we had and choices that we made, uh, drilling down into uh, characterization, how we, how we casted uh, the different roles, and then down into the nitty gritty of our day-to-day uh, -day production pipeline. 
But starting with these kind of macro decisions, you know, there were some big choices to make when we were starting out on Hades, such as what game should we even make? But certain things were foregone conclusions. And one of those is that uh, audio and narrative would be key to this game. That's something that has been key to each of our games. And uh, myself and Darren um, are closely involved in the, in the conception of each of our games and are there early on to try and kind of discover the particular vibe and atmosphere that we want. And the audio is always a really, really big part of that. There's nothing like music and the human voice uh, to immediately sort of create a particular mood. Uh, so we know we knew we wanted to use that, and we also knew that we wanted to work with Logan. Yes, this is Logan Cunningham standing next to that giant BAFTA right there. Uh, fun fact, Logan Cunningham won a BAFTA for his performances in Hades. Uh, but but that's getting ahead of ourselves. He has voiced characters in all of our games and been a, a really key part of our of our process, uh, knowing that he was going to be involved. Uh, we're going to give some examples of each of the uh, character some of the characters he's played in each of our games uh, here here's a, a sample from bastion proper story is supposed to start at the beginning ain't so simple with this one now here's a kid whose whole world got all twisted leaving him stranded on a rock in the sky and so he plays the narrator in that game who is almost the only voice you hear he talks to you almost the entire time you play uh so he's he's very much the primary character in that game in 2014's transistor uh, he is the main principal character in that game as well. There, we added a couple more supporting characters, but he really uh, still had the, the primary role. Hey, Red. We're not going to get away with this, are we? And then in 2017's Pyre, we still expanded our cast a little bit more. We added more characters, but Logan had the only English-speaking character in the game, who was, of course, the primary character, the Arch Justice. Reba! Dare you tamper with forbidden knowledge? And so, yeah, that's a that's just a little uh, snippet of Logan's performances in these games. In fact, in, in Pyre, he ended up playing several more characters, but that was his his main one. Yeah. So we we love working with Logan. We love discovering um, the just what else, what other kinds of characters he could play. Um, so it was exciting to go into Hades knowing. Uh, he could play any number of characters in this game. Uh, and each of our games is kind of a reaction to the last game we worked on. And uh, so a special shout out to Pyre, our third game, for informing so much of what Hades is, despite the big differences in those games. Uh, in Pyre, it was our first time working with a, a larger cast. And we kind of sidestepped the issue of, you know, not every character and not every actor is as much of a genius as Logan by having just about everyone speak in like a gibberish language where there's less pressure on it to just uh, be kind of an amazing uh, English language performance. Um, but that gave us the confidence to work with a big cast and be able to take that next step uh, into uh, creating a fully voiced game. That was something we were drawn to doing um, on this game from the start, uh, mainly for this kind of bolded bullet point. We felt that it would really help bring these characters to life despite having kind of limited uh, presentation techniques, right? We don't have like uh, fully performance captured amazing cutscenes and stuff like that, but we do have actors like Logan uh, who can through their voice alone uh, make these characters seem to pop out um, of the game. Um, we wanted the narrative to do a bunch of different things, uh, particularly to mitigate the kind of sting of failure uh, that can make you want to rage quit out of a roguelike game instead of experiencing what's so great about roguelike games, which is that they're different every single time you play. We knew voiceover was powerful. Um, and yeah, it was, it was our time uh, to take uh, the next step and try to deliver on this uh, tonal range that we had in mind that could range from serious to silly. And again, what better way to kind of deliver on a particular tone than through the variety of voices. Uh, of course, uh, it raised many questions about how we would actually pull this off. Yes, uh, you know there were risks associated with with uh, going fully voiced in, in our mind. You know, we we never tried having a non-silent protagonist before. You know, we how do you reconcile uh, the protagonist characterization with how the player feels? Uh, as that character and and how do you reconcile the the point of view and personality of that character and everything so that was something that we had to consider uh tone and accent how does the character speak uh, how should all the characters in this game speak the gods ghosts and monsters of greek myth 
what do they sound like? And what languages do they speak? And do they have accents when they speak those languages was another consideration. Uh, we knew we were going to have a big cast in this game. The question was how big, right? How many characters do we want, do we need? What's going to what's going to fill out the cast in a satisfying way? And how do we find the actors to play them uh, using the resources at our disposal? And also another consideration for us is, you know, not everyone is a is a BAFTA award winning actor. Uh, uh, you know, some of us on the team do voices in the game and stuff. So part of part of the worry there was just making sure that the other performances in the game could sort of live in the same game as Logan's we knew would be very good performances in the game. Uh, so so just making sure that there was a sort of con quality consistency um, across across the cast. And then in terms of content volume, you know, it, it's a huge game that you can play forever. How many voice lines do you need to support that and to, to make it really feel like you, you're not running out of content at any particular point? And then in terms of production, you know, what's our budget and localization plan for a massive uh, game like this. And, and we're not gonna dig too much into that here, but that was something we definitely considered. Yeah, so these were big looming questions, uh, but we, uh, to, to quote Zagreus, whatever, let's try it was kind of our answer to all of them. Um, and so uh, we dug into actually creating the characters of this game, knowing that they would be speaking. Uh, starting with our boy Zagreus here, this is, uh, a painting uh, by Gen Z, our art director, whose artwork you see throughout this presentation. In fact, a big shout out to her for all the incredible artwork um, uh, for, for all these characters. She nailed this character pretty much right away. Uh, there was very little uh, for her to go on other than he's the son of the God of the Dead. Um, but uh, there really wasn't much to go on for Zagreus at all. We get asked sometimes, um, you know, even, it, some players think that he's our own invention, but he does come from classical mythology. Uh, particularly, he's referenced in this uh, ancient fragment of a play about Sisyphus uh, by the poet Aeschylus, um, who in this in this uh, quote, the hospitaller is is Hades himself. So we're we're doing research into Greek myth and the underworld and come across this scrap of like, wait a minute, Hades had a son. I've been studying Greek myth since I was a little kid. I never heard of this. Um, and that alone was so compelling just to kind of uncover the story that it became uh, the basis for the whole game. Um, Jen, you know, was drawn to this idea of, well, we were all drawn to this idea of making our first ever so-called power fantasy character, which is one of the most uh, tiresome ideas in, in game development, honestly, because uh, like power, uh, power fantasy characters are there all over the place. We just had never done one ourselves. We, we'd avoided the idea of making a character who's kind of explicitly kind of better than the player um, you know, faster, stronger, better looking, knows what to say in every situation, all that kind of stuff. But we wanted to subvert the tropes around this kind of idea as well. He's not quite, Zagreus is not quite what he appears to be. He's emotionally vulnerable. He's, he's kind, he's polite, um, despite uh, what you may assume about him. Um, and really, uh, uh, we wanted to deeply understand his relationship with Hades as being kind of at the heart of the character. And we figured if we knew, if we had a good understanding of that, then we would get past uh, some of the cliches. Um, at the bottom of this slide here, you see an example from a spreadsheet I maintain throughout development that has all the characters in it. This happens to have only the row uh, with Zagreus. Um, it has things like the, the tone photo reference. We'll get to uh, Loki there in, in just a moment, but it also has things like the uh, highly cerebral tonality stack rank, uh, suggesting that the character should be cool, badass, and hot in that particular order. So um, if you want to know about our highly artful process, um, there you go. But this is a language that Jen and I uh, understand when talking about characters. Uh, we also understand a variety of different references. And there aren't too many people at Supergiant for whom all of these references click. Um, they do click for, for me, maybe maybe uh, for, for a few others. But um, you know, on one side with, with someone like Jen, I'm talking about Alucard and Dante and Spike Spiegel. And with Darren, you know, we're talking about Loki, uh, talking about the Dread Pirate Roberts. The Princess Bride is a movie uh, actually we kept coming back to as a really strong sort of tonal analogy. Uh, it could range from silly to serious in a manner similar to what we wanted. But this guy Loki here, he had the look, he had the vibe uh, similar to what we were going for. So with that in mind, we wrote the casting sides uh, for Zagreus. We're like, okay, here he is. Here's our, our guy. Let's get some auditions. Let's see what we could get uh, for, a vo uh, for his voice. But we had uh, a lot of trouble finding his voice. This was a character that was not necessarily in Logan's wheelhouse. 
Yeah, and and so we got we got a few reads for Zagreus um, based on these sides, and none of them were sort of hitting all of the marks that we wanted them to hit, and we all had something specific in mind, I think, that they weren't quite achieving. So I ended up recording some scratch for this just to try to put something in um, to, to, to take a stab at it and just see if, if we could sort of get somewhere a little bit closer on, on what Zag might sound like. Um, and so this is, a, this is an example of, of the read that I did for Zagreus. I'm home. I'm home. I'm home. Um, carry on, everyone. Don't mind me. That could have gone better. That could have gone better. <laughs> that could have gone better. <clears throat> well, time to go get killed again. I'm home. Oops. I'm and home. When I when I heard that time to go get killed again, I was like, Darren, you've been holding out on us. <laughs> like, how is he? How Darren does all of our music, all of our sound effects, all the voice recording, and you know, he just casually delivers you know the winning audition for for Zagreus of course that was just my initial impression and uh it's by no means uh a unilateral uh decision so we had to get uh Darren's takes uh into the game and and present them as part of our team playtest and stuff but everybody everybody liked it um and and we didn't look back but there were a lot of decisions to make along the way like we played around with Zag's it wasn't a foregone conclusion that Zagreus would speak with a British accent, for example. Uh, Darren did a take that was uh, all like kind of in an American accent as well. Uh, but we decided, uh, certainly between us, I think we both agreed that the, the British accent is like the de facto uh, accent of historic Western uh, fantasy, right? Like from things like Lord of the Rings and, and Game of Thrones, it's just an accent that gets associated with uh, sometimes totally imaginary worlds um, and yet everyone speaks speaks neutral English. Uh, but we do use the American accent as well to represent a kind of cultural divide in the setting. So the characters native to the underworld speak American like us um, and characters kind of of, of Greek uh, origin or surface origin uh, speak with with the British accent. And And to be clear, you know, I was not, uh, expecting to voice Zagreus even several sessions deep into the game. I think the the, the actual fire files themselves are called like Zagreus Scratch. Yeah. And we just expected to replace them eventually and never and never ended up doing it. Yeah, it, it ended up being a kind of a big additional chunk of work for you, but uh, hopefully <laughs> hopefully you had fun. Um, yeah, it was a good, good yeah. time. <laughs> um, now, uh, certain characters like this one are not quite as as difficult to cast as others, right? Yes, that's true. I think Lord Hades may have been the fastest we've ever found the voice of a character. Uh, we, you know, Greg wrote up some sides with Logan Cunningham in mind. We knew he was going to play this guy. Uh, you know, Logan and I talked about some references like uh, darkness in in uh, in Legend, uh, Tim Curry's character in Legend, and and a couple other references. And and we just Greg sent him the sides, and and this is the read that he did. Uh, for that, with a little bit of processing on it. Stupid boy. I told you you'd be back. And how was your wanton ransacking of my domain? And that's pretty much exactly the character. I mean, it's just like, yep, that's it. We heard it, and that was Hades. Yeah. So then we got to a point where um, it was time to kind of put it all together, right? And this, uh, yeah, Darren, when, when did we make this thing? This was uh, in August of 2018, less than a year into development. This is a really, really early build of the game. And what you're going to see here is, you know, you're going to hear Zagreus, you're going to hear Hades, you're going to hear the storyteller, and uh, you're, it's going to help coalesce some of the tone, tonal ideas that we were working on through the voiceover. Here. I'm home. <clears throat> yes, carry on, everyone. Don't mind me. The House of Hades, that dark and lavishly appointed lair of the underworld's king, is home not just to him, but to his willful progeny. Shut up, old man. Back already. Stupid boy. 
I told you nobody gets out of here, whether alive or dead. Though so how was your wanton ransacking of my domain? Greetings, Father. My ransacking was a delight, thank you for asking. So I'll just be on my way again. Be on your way indeed. What do I care? You shall never reach the surface. Go, see for yourself. And you may notice if you played a lot of Hades that several of these lines shipped with the actual game. These are really, really early, and they, they made it all the way through uh, to the final release. Yeah, we never can tell with that stuff what's going to stick. Um, so we were quite happy with how things were going at around the time um, we put together that. Uh, uh, we don't really use the term vertical slice, but that's kind of like what, what it was, essentially our first uh, production content. It was expressing this relationship between Hades and Zagreus that we were excited about. But then we got the whole underworld. It's time to figure out the supporting cast. We knew we wanted the tone of the game to be much broader than, than just uh, you know, what Hades and Zagreus uh, represent. So we um, considered a lot of different angles on who else should be in this game. One thing that came very quickly was the idea that the Olympians are gonna be there. Um, we quickly got a bunch of Olympians um, in the game. Um, the, uh, the underworld also gives us some of these like iconic characters that you probably know from just any exposure to Greek myth, uh, the, the Hellhound Cerberus, the Boatman of the River Styx, Charon, a Sisyphus internally toiling with his boulder. Those kind of characters were exciting to us and we wanted them uh, to be part of this world. We also thought about, you know, well, that our vision of the House of Hades, it's almost like a place of business. Who works there uh, in what roles, you know, who was who was Zagreus's father figure if, if Hades wasn't doing it for him and these characters like Achilles came came from that. Um, and really, you know, we also thought about it from the production angle. How many characters uh, will be even welcome in this game? How many do we have time and, and room for? Um, and uh, a lot of our early stabs at these characters just stuck. We got these characters like Achilles, Nyx, uh, Hypnos, Dusa, Skelly. Uh, they were all in the game quite early. They tested well with our team. We had fun working on them and, and we just kind of never looked back. And a lot of the Olympians came online uh, early on as well. Uh, our, our idea for the Olympians that they're kind of like the awkward uh, Thanksgiving family dinner uh, type of idea. It really informed the characterizations for them like Poseidon as the boisterous inappropriate uncle and so on and so forth that made um, it gave us clear ideas for the characterizations of each one, and we got them in the game, and um, things felt like they were they were coming together quickly um, at that point. Uh, a lot of the other characters, we just kind of trickled in over early access. Some we didn't even plan for at all, um, like Electo and Patroclus, um, and it's, it's funny to think back on how we didn't even imagine those characters at all um, at the beginning when they ended up being quite uh, significant to the story, but that's that's part of the beauty of early access, which we'll be coming back to again and again. Now, um, we have all these characters in mind. It's it's time to find who's going to portray them. And what is the first question that we ask when it comes time uh, to cast a new character? Yes, the question is, can Logan do it? That is the that's the first question we ask, and the answer is often yes. Uh, there are five of the six characters Logan plays pictured on this screen. The only reason the sixth one is not here is because he is the narrator and has no portrait. Uh, but yes, Logan plays a bunch of characters in this game. He's got a huge range. And, and part of the idea behind that is embracing our constraints as a small studio, using the resources available to us. And Logan is an incredible actor who happens to be very close with us uh, as a studio and as a friend. So he, we consider him to be an incredible resource to use as much as possible. And so once the answer to that question becomes no, can Logan do it? No, not this character. Uh, then we need to expand our search a little bit. So we try to tap our network. Uh, can any of us on the team do it? This, this photograph here is a photograph uh, from me in high school with Peter Canavesi, who is the high school, my, was my high school drama teacher and, and he was the moderator for the improv club that Logan and I were in. Uh, he, in fact, plays Zeus and Chaos in this game. Uh, and he did a few voices for us on Pyre. So, uh, you know, he, he did an incredible read for Zeus and, and, and did a great job as Chaos. So we were thrilled to be able to work with him again. I ended up voicing Zagreus and Skelly. And Skelly is one of those characters where the character was sort of built around this silly voice that I like to do. Uh, 
where it was kind of like this. It was, originally, it was a guy talked to them more like that. And then, <laughs> but Skelly needed to be a little more high energy and deliver a little bit more information more quickly. So he kind of got combined with almost like a Joe Pesci vibe. Like, hey, hey, boy, oh, uh, hit me over here. What are you doing? You know, that kind of thing. So um, that's sort of how, I, I, Greg could speak a little bit more to that, but that's kind of how he came about. Yeah, uh, Skelly, as you can tell, is uh, very deeply rooted in classical Greek mythology uh, <laughs> and we uh, we had a lot of fun, uh, you know, with him, we're testing the boundaries of the tone of this game, right? And like he started off as as kind of a joke, um, but everybody liked him and we liked working on him. Um, so so he stuck. And he's not even the first time uh, something like that happened. Like Dusa started off as as a bit more of like a frivolous character um, who became really important to the game. And back on Pyre, uh, Logan's uh, principal character started off based on like a funny voice that he would do from time to time. So it's just, again, like it, based on our constraints, based on stuff that we enjoy doing, uh, seeing what we could do uh, with all that. Of course, uh, there would come times when uh, the answer to, you know, can Logan do it would be no. The answer to, can we keep it in the family? You know, can Darren and or Peter Canavesi or any of us do it would also be no. And then we would have to reach um, a little bit further. That's right. Yeah, we, we had to uh, get auditions actually for, for some characters from outside of our network of, of people who were either on the team or people that we knew immediately. So, you know, we would look for recommendations from people that we trusted, uh, friends of friends, that sort of thing. Greg spent uh, a fair share of time uh, scouring voice acting, hashtag voice acting on Twitter and other online sources, and then sort of cold emailing actors that seem promising for particular characters. Um, and then once uh, we would receive the auditions, you know, I, I had several criteria upon which I, I like to evaluate them. Uh, is the characterization unique relative to our existing cast? Can this person kind of slot into the game and not overlap too much with any other particular character that we have? Is the delivery believable and natural? Uh, does it does it sound like someone speaking or does it sound like they're reading? Uh, is the accent believable if there is one? That's another thing that sort of, uh, you know, leans into that previous point there. And then this one to me is actually one of the most critical um, is, is the understanding of the text itself. Does the actor get it? Are they conveying all the sort are they mining the line for all the beats that are in there and trying to convey each one separately and and play all of the changes uh of course they're sending us an undirected audition and in the actual recording it would be directed and and, and if they didn't perceive all that stuff we could sort of you know direct them to to add it but just hearing that in the audition is such like a ah oh, they get it you know it's such a relief so so we we know that it's going to be easy for us in the booth uh, if, if, if the audition comes back with that stuff in it. And then, of course, the an another question we have is, does it meet or even exceed our expectations for the character? Is it exactly what we're asking for? Sometimes we'll get an audition, we'll hear it and be like, yep, that's it. That's perfect. That's exactly what I had in my head. And sometimes we'll get an audition that's like, ooh, that's, I did not expect that. And I it's even better than the thing that I imagined. Uh, and yeah. so this next character is an example of, of, of that one. Yeah, and uh, this this is one of those, you know, you're talking about believable and natural delivery. That's another one we really, really uh, prioritize highly because yep. even though we have these larger than life characters or literal gods in most cases, uh, we want them to just kind of believe the circumstances that they're in. This is just normal everyday life to them and they they should convey that in the in the delivery so that they're, we don't uh, try to go for like cartoonish voices. Um, and and it's, it's worked out well for us. Um, so Megara here, was a really, really important character in part because she's one of the only characters in Hades that you can't skip. Uh, if you don't like talking to Hades, you don't like talking to Dusa or Achilles, forget about them. You, you could just walk right by and it's fine. But Megara stands in your way um, at, as the first boss. You're going to run into her over and over again. And with her, we wanted to express uh, a lot of what was unique uh, about this game, where the story is, is kind of constantly unfolding and advancing. So you know, when you play a game like this, your own experience as a player is that the first time fighting a boss is different from the 20th time fighting a boss. And we wanted uh, the relationship between Zagreus and Megara to kind of reflect the player's own journey. So it's a lot of pressure on this character to be a lot of things. Um, and we certainly did not have an actor, uh, an actress in mind. Um, so we did the thing that we would do. Uh, we created the the casting sides um, and and we started to look for actresses, though even in this case, we did kind of keep this one uh, in the family, at least indirectly, didn't we? 
Yeah, sort of. Uh, you know, so so the the actress who plays this, who ended up playing this character, uh, is named Avalon Penrose, and she is uh, good buddies with Courtney Vignes, who plays uh, who plays Dusa and Aphrodite, and who happens to be married to Michael Ailshai, who is the voice of Orpheus and a former Supergiant employee. So it's sort of in the family. And a uh, fun fact here is that real life Meg and real life Dusa are good buddies, which is which is kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, just like they are in the game. So we, you know, we're we're kind of sweating bullets about this character. Who are we going to find? And and one day we just get uh, this performance from Avalon Penrose. Your father sent me. All in all, I'd rather be on your bad side than his. Now, you can turn back like a good little man. Or I can send you home the painful way. What'll it be? Yeah, and yeah. we heard that, and we're just like, oh, that's that's it. It's more interesting than the thing we thought of. You know, as you can see here, our voice reference in the sheet is something like, uh, you know, Furiosa from Mad Max Fury Road, and and this is this just is even even more subtle, more interesting. The sort of hushed way she's speaking is like, oh, what a cool idea to have this antagonist that you fight and have this complicated relationship, have this sort of hushed way of speaking. It's very cool. And, and she ended up actually with the third most lines in the entire game. So uh, this is a, a really critical character and we're so glad that we found Avalon. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, to summarize the casting process here, we create the casting sides and, and that's actually a great tool for us to align internally on a character before we even send them out. So it's, it's actually really useful for us uh, from a character development standpoint. And sometimes we have character art, sometimes we'll have some sort of tonal reference image uh, on the sheet, uh, depending on uh, on the on the particular sides. And then of course we ask, can we cast this character internally? Can Logan do it? Can somebody else on team do it? Can somebody we know do it? And then if not, if not, we all we sort of reach outside of our our network of actors uh, when we need to. And then we'll evaluate the auditions, test them in game, gather feedback and uh, vet the casting choices with the, the wider team. And then we cast the part and we scheduled the first recording. And this is you and Logan cast in what, what oh, yes. Henry the yes. Fifth. This is a picture. <laughs> yes, I, I can't believe I forgot to mention. This is Logan this is and I, part. Henry the Fourth in the year 2000. We're both playing middle-aged men, as you can tell from our gray temples. <laughs> yes. So going going way back. Um, yes. Yeah. So that's our, that's our casting process uh, in a nutshell. Um, the doing some things kind of fast and loose and seeing what we can do uh, with with the folks that we have. Um, but now it's time to get into uh, the the real uh, devil in the details. So before we start recording, we need some stuff to record. Um, and that's where the writing process comes in. Um, the writing process, you know, snugly fits onto a single slide. It wasn't too fancy. Um, the part where we had a game structure uh, that you could play forever and keep running into the same characters over and over meant that there was no shortage of content ideas, uh, having like different stuff for characters to talk about. The part where we were recording very frequently uh, due to uh, early access milestones and stuff like that um, solved one of the key issues that writers such as myself experience, which is procrastination. Nothing like a deadline uh, to spur you uh, out of a writer's block and so on. So. And when you know that a great actor like Avalon or Logan uh, is is uh, expecting to record some stuff soon, you really want to uh, get do a bang up job and have enough good stuff for them. Um, you know, I committed uh, sacrilege by writing most of the stuff just straight into Google Sheets or sometimes directly into game data. Um, and in addition to all the story content, there was a high emphasis on on so called barks, just the kind of uh, quick repeatable lines that uh, mostly Zagreus would say in all sorts of different contexts, because again, you can play the game forever. We didn't want these lines to be repetitive. So by the time we play through all the different options, it has been you know, hopefully hours and hours and hours and you don't notice the repeats. Uh, what really helped was having an outline for the story uh, early in the process. And then from there, all the writing was done kind of much more tactically based on what we were working on at the time, but knowing where it was all going um, with the conclusion. Oh, this here is an example of the spreadsheet that we used. Um, it, there's the column marked line, which is the actual stuff that the actor records. We're looking at Thanatos here. Um, there, we've used this format basically with minor changes ever since Bastion. So it's not fancy, but it's worked for us. 
there's the line number. Uh, we include context information and uh, we also include uh, a, a subtext information uh, in that sentiment column. That's really useful sometimes of saying like what's really behind this line. What, what does the character really mean? Uh, and uh, Darren is recording without me the vast majority of the time. So it helps uh, to know kind of what, what's supposed to be behind each, each line like that. And then uh, it is time to record. Yes. So we're going to show you a clip from the documentary by Noclip called Developing Hell. Hades Developing Hell, and it, it's, uh, it's on YouTube. You can find it yourself. But this is an example of what it's like when I'm recording lines uh, for Zagreus in the booth. We're good to go here. Let's see. <clears throat> Check. Hey, I hear my voice. OK, let me just yeah, a little bit down a little bit. I don't even remember what the last thing that was recorded in here was. I have no idea. Death area. So this is when I arrive back in the house of Hades after being killed by the bull. By the Minotaur. Uh, that's one bad bull. Uh, that's, <clears throat> uh, that's one bad bull. Ugh. Uh, that's one bad bull. First take. H24. That was H23. H24. Oh, I got the horns. Uh, I got the horns. Uh, I got the horns. <laughs> oh, blasted ghost minotaur. <laughs> That's probably the one. <laughs> As you could probably tell, Things got a little weird when I was in the booth for myself by myself for too long. Uh, so, so the the process illustrated there, you know, is that that for each line we would do a minimum of two takes. Uh, we would pre-slate the line, saying the number of the line, recording the number of the line into the microphone, and then I would live sort of decide what the winning take was, and then have the actor repeat that into the microphone, second take, third take, etc. And that is for the the benefit of Brad Hagman, who was the editor of all the voiceover in the game, who, so I would send him these sessions and he would uh, chop up the lines and edit them, clean them up and name them and send them back to me for processing. Uh, so I'm going to show you one more video here, which is uh, sort of an example of how I applied processing for, uh, in this case, chaos. So this is the effects chain for chaos who I would say is probably the most heavily processed character in all of Hades. So I'm just gonna go through really quickly all of the effects in the chain. So first we got a compressor, then we got an EQ, standard stuff. Then we've got two instances of Urcam tracks. Uh, it's by Flux, so it's Urcam tracks version three. It's a really crazy uh, VO processing software. And both of them I have about a 50% mix in this first one and then a 60% mix in the other one. And they have a lot of funky controls. Um, but the, that's what is the uh, principal thing that you're hearing on Chaos's voice. And then after that, we've got just a basic limiter. And then we've got a reverse reverb. And then we've got a regular old reverb at the end. So I'm going to play it back. And the way we have it here is this is the track that I use for recording with no effects on it. And then uh, all the selects will get chopped out and moved on to this track down below here. And this is the one with all the effects on it. So I'm going to play that back now and you can you can see what that's like. 234. Perhaps this. Perhaps this. Perhaps this. Second take. And so you can see, you can hear Peter called out the number. He did a take, he did another take, and he did another take, and at the end he called out second take. And so that is in fact the one that gets chopped out and cleaned up by Brad, and then it gets named. And you can see all of these are named similar file names, 235, 236, and so on, chaos underscore. And that is to mirror the name in the spreadsheet, in the script spreadsheet. And that's it. Yeah, I'll just have the actor record a single giant file usually. Uh, this one, in this case, was recorded in the studio. And, uh, and then it all gets chopped up and named by Brad. And then, once Brad does all the editing, he sends it back to me. 
and I apply the processing and render it all out. One thing I want to give a shout out to is batch rendering in Logic, which I discovered after Transistor. Uh, <laughs> it really helps when you put a whole bunch of lines on a track, select them all, and can render them all at once uh, with baked-in processing. That, that really saved a bunch of time. So, so once, once the lines are rendered, then there you know, are many, many technical considerations to consider. Uh, we want to consider how we name the files. We're going to have thousands of files to organize. So we tried to optimize them for searchability. Uh, we had the character name underscore 0002 was our naming convention. Uh, we had a hunch we were going to need a thousands place for this game, uh, <laughs> hence the three zeros in front of the two. One limitation, obviously, is that we can't have over 10,000 lines in a single spreadsheet, but that proved not to be an issue. We got kind of close with Zag, but uh, but not 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 too close. It was OK. And then in terms of file management, you know, we have thousands of wave files to manage. Uh, and our solution for that was just to throw them all in a VO folder. <laughs> so we have these th thousands of, of files in one particular folder. Uh, each character has their own sort of actor template queue in FMOD. And that single queue is used to play all of that character's VO files. And each actor template has its own settings, uh, you know, spatial spatialization settings, uh, sound size, distance, fall off, all that stuff and uh, busing and reverb and, and whatnot. So, uh, and FMOD, for those of you unfamiliar, is the audio middleware that we use to integrate the audio into the game. Uh, and then of course, when you have thousands of voiceover lines, memory can be a consideration and, and can you do stream them or load them into memory? Uh, basically, we were instructed by our, our engineers, however, to just sort of go nuts and they would figure it out uh, at the end. And, and we did and they did. <laughs> yes. um, and, That's we went. Yes. So once um, once Darren would you know, render out a, a batch from one of our voiceover sessions, then it's it's off to me, and I always felt like a kid in a candy store. Uh, I had the I think I have a fairly uh, unique privilege in being able to integrate uh, the voiceover uh, myself. I think a lot of writers uh, working in the game industry don't necessarily. Uh, have as hands-on of a role in making sure everything is kind of playing the way it's supposed to, all the all the timings are just so, um, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and this video will show you a little bit about what that process is like. Craig here to give you a quick tour of how we script the voiceover in Hades. Uh, using my friend Thanatos here as an example, here's Thanatos as he exists in data in this file called npcdata.lua. Uh, we're looking at the data through a utility called Sublime Text, which you can download. Uh, Thanatos has uh, all of his story events uh, in this kind of format. It's a script-like format uh, developed by Gavin Simon, one of our engineers and uh, co-founders. Uh, so, you know, line by line, Thanatos talks, then Zagreus talks, then Thanatos again. Uh, I could put an arbitrary amount of presentation, um, you know, through uh, character animations or alternate portraits and things like that. And I just plug in the voice lines, plug in the text, uh, and that's all there is to it at the simplest level. Uh, events can have various requirements. Um, and that is how we determine the sequencing um, of events along with some good old fashioned randomness. Uh, for example, this requirement just says, you know, you have to have interacted with Thanatos at least one time for this event to be eligible. Um, and, you know, over time, we just added lots and lots of events uh, to Thanatos. I'm actually going to hit page down instead of mouse wheel. As you can see, he's got a lot. These are just um, events with Thanatos at the House of Hades, he actually has a separate uh, entry for the version of him you encounter, you know, out in the field. Um, these events are ordered in a way that makes sense to me um, with kind of the more generic, more repeatable events down at the bottom. And you get the picture. The other half of this is uh, a function called is game state eligible, which started off very simple, letting us do things like determine um, the chance to play for an event, say a 50-50 chance or something like that, or required text lines is a requirement I use very frequently that just says, you know, has this story event already occurred? But as we went on in development, um, things got more and more specific. For instance, we added a phishing system in early access because of course, um, and so that introduced things like required has fish, you know, required min caught fish this run, has no fish, min held fish, 
min total caught fish, any caught fish types, any caught fish types of each, any caught fish types this run, max total caught fish. Um, so that gives you some impression. You know, we couldn't have imagined we would need all this stuff at the very beginning or even when we first had the fishing system. Uh, but as I ran into more examples of uh, story events where the specificity was needed, uh, I could add these or in some cases get engineering support to add them. And that's how we did it. So if you take anything away from this talk, fish, I guess. Um, the part the video didn't get into, uh, it, kind of the other half of voiceover integration is uh, all of the barks, the, the kind of contextual lines that play out in the world, uh, Zag Zagreus's quips and stuff like that. Uh, those are integrated much the same way, uh, just kind of line by line. Um, they could have all the same requirements uh, either uh, on the entire batch or on an individual line. So, and again, we just try to have lots and lots of them. Um, th uh, we have a playback system where all of them will play randomly until the whole table is depleted. And then we kind of reload the whole table just to get at the maximum amount of variety and reduce chances of anything playing back to back, that sort of thing. I'm really, really grateful to our QA team uh, for uh, for making sure all this stuff worked because yeah, the, the narrative, uh, the amount of narrative content in this game kind of spun out of control to a certain extent and between our early access players and our QA team they they kept it um, they kept it going and making sure everything was sounding good yeah for sure I mean and and one of so once once everything is integrated after Greg has done that that you know the process that is mystical to me somewhat of integrating all the everything into script uh, and we play test internally a bunch to make sure everything is working before we send it out into the world, especially before early access. We relied more heavily on the internal play test where the whole team plays everything. Uh, early access, of course, was an incredible source of feedback. And we read every piece of it uh, between our Discord and Reddit and all the other places that feedback was delivered to us. We made sure to read it and respond to it the best we could. Uh, one other thing that was interesting about the early access feedback is that it sort of protected the characters. Like once they were out in the world, we we did you know we didn't want to cut a character that we'd already sort of released into the game uh for example so so i think greg was was grateful for that 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 none of his the hard work that we'd done to to make these characters could be undone uh by our waffling on it or something uh early access feedback also helped shore up our confidence in the tone because the response had been so positive uh to a lot of the characters and and the voiceover that that it gave us motivation to really keep pushing as hard as we could and it was really helpful for iterating on small stuff and fleshing out the characters a ton because it really uh, exposed areas where, oh, we could do some more here. We could we could push on this here with this character. Uh, and it also led to some some silly stuff that we ended up doing. Uh, so so, you know, lava when it is under the ground technically is called magma, and there was a point in development where we had recorded maybe two dozen lines across five characters where they are saying the word lava uh referring to magma and somebody on reddit pointed this out uh and we greg saw it was like you know what we should probably go and fix that so so here's an example how was the lava temperature lately lerny how was the magma temperature lately lerny we went back and, and and picked up every single one of those uh, two dozen or so lines across all those characters. Yeah, and the, the this wasn't like meanly delivered. No one was like roasting us for 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 getting you know third grade uh, geology or whatever uh, the difference between lava and magma. But it was one of those things where like I think if left to our own devices, we just would have shipped this you know maybe insignificant error, but an error nonetheless. And uh, yeah, it's just an example of how uh, our community. Uh, was able to help us identify all these like little opportunities to just try and try and improve little aspects of the game. They kept us honest. <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, we were just kind of hurtling. Uh, the The early access nature meant that the next um, milestone was kind of always around the corner. So we were just in the thick of it, uh, making it happen, and didn't have a ton of ability to kind of reflect back um, on the process, but. Uh, something that really worked for us looking back on it was knowing it, uh, Hades was going to be an early access game. We approached the story like like a serial, almost like a TV show with the early access launch being like a pilot um, and knowing that the 1.0 launch would be like the finale. So w with the uh, with the early access launch, we introduced some of the characters, set the stakes, uh, but 
the story doesn't end there. And we just kind of built it out uh, update by update until we finally uh, introduced the ending um, in, in, our, in our final update before launch. Um, having that outline was really, really valuable. Um, it let us, we still could veer off course every which way and introduce characters we didn't anticipate, but we knew what the through line was going to be. Um, Darren and I, you know, were not a big team between the two of us. So it was incredibly valuable that Darren could just like solo record, not just himself, but with uh, basically our entire cast. I usually wouldn't be there uh, because I would often be still writing while Darren was recording. So that was it really helped. Uh, save a ton of time um and yeah we would just keep like playing uh, playing ourselves uh watching streams listening to feedback and it just kept spawning new ideas uh for for content and we'd always try to make time for the small kind of so-called unimportant moments unimportant in quotation marks because they're actually some of the most you know i think delightful moments in the game that you can experience even though they're not strictly needed um if you're interested in uh, all the stuff we did with dialogue. There's this video uh, from the YouTube channel, People Make Games, that delves into it uh, really deeply uh, that I recommend. Now, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the production of the game was not without its challenges, uh, <laughs> not, not least of which were the, the, the growing scope of the game. Uh, as, as we added more and more to the game, there were more contexts that seemed like they needed VO that was highly specific to that context. And so, as the game expanded, so did the VO scope, and it just kind of snowballed. And the more positive feedback we got on characters, it made us want to push on those characters more and give them more to talk about and more to do, more to say. And of course, uh, localization, as you can see from that terrified emoji, you know, uh, this was an involved process, <laughs> localizing the 300,000 or so words uh, in the game. Uh, early access development uh, also pr provided its own sort of challenges. Uh, the next big update was sort of always around the corner. Uh, Greg, I'll let you uh, I'll let you speak to this a little bit more directly. Yeah, the the pressure to get it right the first time, as it were. So even though we're an early access game, and you know technically nothing's finished, and technically everything can still be iterated on, uh, as soon as we would put new story stuff into the game, it was as though it was you know came from classical mythology itself and was instantly canonical. So. Um, it, it was like unthinkable, the idea of like, oh, we're going to cut this character or we're going to completely rewrite this character. Um, we, we felt that, that pressure, but it was a, it was a good pressure because, uh, players are really enjoying the, the characters on the whole. And yeah, we were just, you know, inundated with feedback. Um, players were really enjoying the game, but they wanted more of it as, as is often the case. Um, and we, we were just busy recording, right? Like, um, sometimes up to three or four. Uh, sessions per week, uh, but there was there was another uh, significant challenge um, last year that that oh, is yeah. worth worth mentioning oh. is this this little guy. <laughs> oh um, yeah, there was a global pandemic in, in two thirds of the way through production. Uh, that that was a thing that happened. Uh, it, it certainly threw a wrench into our plans a little bit. Uh, we had to do all of our VO recording remotely. A lot of it previously was being done in the actual office. We had a vocal booth in the office um, uh, that you saw in that no clip documentary. That's where that was happening. And so we just had to improvise. We had uh, almost a third of the game's content left to record, I would say at that point. Yeah. So we just sent all the actors snowballs, uh, blue snowballs here, which is, you know, good little soldier mic that, <laughs> that, that did the job. Logan used this mic for all of Pyre. So I, I had confidence that it would just at least work. Uh, you know, it didn't, it wasn't going to necessarily match the sound of the mic we were recording them on in the office and the sort of outboard gear that I had that flowing going through. Um, but I just figured, well, we just got to get them recorded and I'll sort it out in post uh, the best I can. So I did my best to match uh, the characters to their previous recordings uh, to the best of my ability. Yeah, and it was uh, obviously such a, a harrowing time. Um, and it just on the on the project, the idea that our entire voiceover production might uh, grind uh, well, the whole game, uh, much less the voiceover production, might grind to a halt uh, was was really scary. Um, uh, but Darren, through his ingenuity, we like barely skipped a beat. We just kept on trucking and um, uh, and recorded so much of the most kind of essential stuff because we were recording all the ending content at that time, some of the most important stuff in the game. Yeah, I think and, I think Zag had like three thousand lines left to record just by yeah, himself. Yeah, it was a it was a lot. It yeah. was the most like concentrated recording and, yeah. and with a lot of actors. Um, but but we did it, and this was our team. Um, 
at the tail end of the project, uh, all all on a happy Zoom call, um, and we, you know, the the voiceover was just a small part of of the puzzle, um, but a really really fun uh, part to work on. You know, we were able to uh, record a whole bunch of stuff that got a really good response. Darren and I, I remember, we were just frequently really blown away and moved by people's like positive response to the to the voice acting because we had so many questions about whether everybody would be able to live up to Logan's standard and all that kind of thing. Uh, early access was really, uh, really, really useful and helping us um, just catch uh, little details. And I think our initial assumption that going fully voiced would help bring these characters to life, I think uh, proved proved to work out very well. Absolutely. And, you know, in hindsight, there are things that I would maybe do a little bit differently, or if we were to do, do you know, on our next, that we could take into our next project. Uh, would be, I'd like to achieve a little bit more sonic consistency perhaps across the, the different characters in terms of what microphones are being used, the signal path, and you know, maybe next time uh, we can not have a global pandemic in the middle of the project that would help, help with that. Uh, <laughs> if somebody could get right on that. Um, <laughs> I'd like to streamline the casting process going forward probably, or, or if I were to go backward, I would streamline the casting process because you know, when we've reached outside of our network of actors, it became pretty stressful and time consuming and it and we were just kind of always worried about whether or not we'd get the thing we were looking for. So maybe I'd we'd try to outsource that to a professional uh, assassin uh, who can find find actors uh, easily. Uh, you know, better file organization is something, you know, maybe our giant single folder for all of the VO files is not the best system, perhaps, uh, and maybe an improved priority system for some of the thornier story events. Uh, would be would be good as well. It would save a lot of QA headaches on the back end, perhaps, and 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 small bugs that way. And in terms of some other lessons that I, I I'm taking forward to whatever we do next is, you know, regular recurring VO sessions really really worked well for us for a lot of reasons. It avoided the crush of uh, of stuff at the end. You don't run out of time necessarily to if you have new ideas you can add them. You can't throw it, anything onto the pile when you already have a mountain. Uh, to record all at once. So that's one benefit. I, I also think it really gave us time to know the characters. And for me as a director and for me as an actor, it really gave me a better understanding of every single character we were recording, just living with them for so long throughout the project and recording them consistently. So it really gave me a better sense of, does this sound like it's in their voice? And if, you know, and, and how would this character say this? Uh, it, it was really important for me. And and I think most importantly of all, the, the one of the most valuable lessons we learned, which was a question that we had when we started this project, was can early access work for narrative games? And you know, I, I feel like for our part, it, it's worked out as as well as we could have hoped um, in, in the case of Hades. So so yeah, it really it, it really was uh, was a, was an exciting way to prove that out. Yeah, it really. Um you know, we would have ended with a much uh, smaller and worse game if we uh, somehow in an alternate reality made Hades without the early access process. So thank you so much for listening. We're so incredibly grateful for the ongoing support for this game. Um, Dar Darren, I know you share my feeling that uh, we're incredibly grateful to our colleagues at Supergiant who do so much inspiring work to where we just want to live up to what they're doing with yeah. with our our own uh, corner of it um and and we've stuck together all this time trying to see how long we can keep going making games together we want to keep on trucking for a while longer and having had this experience on Hades we're excited for what's next absolutely yeah i mean you you, you can't take a look at this image that Jen and Joanne collab on here and and think, you know what? I'm just gonna phone it in. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta give it, you gotta match the caliber of this kind of stuff. So so yeah, for my part, I I really, I really um am grateful to the entire team uh for the privilege to be able to work on games with them and and uh and thank you to GDC for having us. Uh it was a delight, delight to be able to to get to talk about this, just a sliver of uh of all the work that went into Hades. Yeah, and thank you to our incredible voice cast for making all this possible. See ya.